Good afternoon. Welcome back to another rendition of the BH virtual event space. A super interesting, exciting day planned for you guys for the next hour. We're going to be joined by Dimitri Gunn, Executive Director of TEDx Cambridge, and the wonderful Emmy Award winning Creative Director and Real Time Supervisor at Framestore, Lawrence Jones. Me, I have no credentials that are going to match up to these guys. I'm your humble correspondent, your host, your moderator, whatever you want to call me. Uh, but today we're taking an inside look at XRLED. For those of you who do not know what XRLED is, stay tuned. You're going to learn some things. We're not going to get too far into the weeds today. Uh, we do have another part two of this, which we're going to dive in further on August 30th. So mark your calendars. I want to thank Panasonic, who is our sponsor for today's event. Uh, huge, huge, huge day for us here because we haven't div uh, dove into this ever at all. So I want to mention uh, that to you, Dimitri Lawrence. Welcome. Great to be here, Derek. Thanks for having us on. Nah, it's, it's our pleasure here. I mean, I'm just going to get right into it. What the heck is XRLED and why? Like, you know, let's start it right there. I mean, we, we all know that we're moving into this age of technology where not everything is, you know, what you see is what you get. There's a lot of computers, a lot of technology advancing. Um, so let's dive right into it there. I'm going to remind everybody, any questions you have, please get them in. You are looking at a wealth of knowledge in Dimitri and Lawrence. So we're going to do our best to answer all of the questions that you do throw in. Special thank you also to everybody joining us on YouTube as we are live streaming there. So Dimitri, break it down for us. If you, you know, start it off, what is XRLED? Why should we know about it? Well, I think it's helpful to provide just a little context into our, our journey into that uh, really interesting rabbit hole. Um, so uh, for for the audience, thank you so much for taking time out of your day or evening or morning uh, to to uh, learn a little bit more about this really exciting topic. So for context, we were based here in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, we are one of the first licensed uh, independent organized TED events in the world. Um, we're the longest running. We're also uh, at the Boston Opera House, which is uh, a little over 2,500 guests, one of the largest independently organized TED events in the world. Uh, and so it's a, it's an honor and privilege uh, to be able to do something at that scale. We're also an all volunteer team. So, you know, Lawrence's day job is at Framestore. Uh, but about 15 or 20 percent of his time, evenings, weekends, and sometimes in the studio is, is spent with us. And so uh, we found that actually during the pandemic, it was a remarkable opportunity to open up and recruit uh, additional talent expertise in support of this exciting journey we're on. So the best place to start is that uh, we were very fortunate that we, we, we founded our organization in, in April of 09, which allowed us to celebrate our 10th anniversary at the Opera House um you know uh, in 2019 so about two years worth of work went into that show and we have a fantastic long-term relationship with panasonic both the pro video as well as the visual systems team so that was a 10 camera 4k shoot uh four varicams four ue 150 ptz's and two of the eva ones um we bring an extraordinary amount of production value uh through our relationship with panasonic to our events and so uh, all the way down to sort of shooting in vlog you know hdr color grading all the way and so we, we got that under a belt. Uh, we were celebrating our first decade. And then obviously, like the rest of the world, the pandemic rolled around. And so we went from, uh, you know, our high watermark associated with that kind of production value for an audience of almost 3,000 guests that night into what now? Um, and so there was a really interesting article in Fast Company back in spring of last year. Um, essentially, it's not the title of the article, but what it was essentially was unfortunately the death of Cirque du Soleil. Uh, right about the same time they laid off 4,000 performers. And there was a great quote in that article uh, that, you know, pre-pandemic, you know, large scale events will be the final element of pre-pandemic life to return to normal. And so at the scale that we operate out, almost 3,000 guests, we realized we were, you know, we were in the same camp that Cirque was. And so we took a conservative approach. We're like, well, um, it's probably going to take two years for this pandemic to play out. Uh, and if that's the case, that's our working hypothesis. Um, how do we continue to, to curate and produce world-class ideas for not only our region, but uh, a worldwide audience of, of people who we love TED Talks? And so uh, that began our sort of process towards, well, what form factor? How do we take that same commensurate level of production value, a 10-camera 4K HDR shoot, and apply it towards virtual? So uh, early on the process, uh, and you can bring up some of these slides, we, we sort of flirted and explored uh, the idea of sort of green screen, um, most of you, I think, are probably familiar with this. This is how weather, weather men and weather women, weather people, I guess, 
um, you know, talk to us each and every day. Um, and I think what we learned or noticed from green screen, uh, there are some challenges with it. And first and foremost, uh, it's the it's the realization that our speakers are almost exclusively academics and researchers and putting them into a green screen uh, cyclorama type environment uh, is extremely foreign. Um, it's sort of it's very off putting for them. Um, are we able to see well, those slides? Yeah, I'm going to pull that up for you again. Cool. Okay. Just a little, little snag here. So the, the challenge for our speakers, uh, and the same applies to, you know, entertainers, which Lawrence uh, has got some great experiences uh, happening around the same sort of time that we were exploring this with green screen. It's just that it's extremely foreign. Uh, the hallmark of a, of a great Ted talk is asking the audience to, to join you on a journey. And that is all about sort of the authenticity, the comfort that comes from being on your A game and essentially saying, hey, I, something's wrong with the world. Come come join me, uh, whether it be a journey discovery, investigation or persuasion. And so as you can see here, uh, large scale sort of green screen psychorama, uh, that's a very intimidating foreign environment. Um, and by nature of our, our, our speakers, they're all academics, they're researchers. And so this sort of terrified them. Um, so what we decided to do was like, well, we've, we have time available to us. We're no longer beholden to a venue and a date. Uh, and if we thought, uh, and it looks like that's probably gonna be the way that plays out, this is gonna take two years. Let's use this, this, the frustration, the anxiety, the pandemic as an opportunity to take a deep dive and learn about XR LED, uh, essentially extended reality LED virtual production. And you know, a lot of you may be familiar with this from uh, like Mandalorian on Disney Plus. Uh, which was the culmination of several years of sort of work and development uh, that Industrial Light and Magic did um, to help sort of bring Star Wars into sort of the 21st century. And so, Derek, if you can pull up some of uh, the ILM shot from The Mandalorian to provide visual context to how a green screen psychorama environment differs from an LED volume or an LED stage volume. Uh, and the critical component is you'll initially see is that like, oh, contents on the wall, you can react to it. You can actually practically light the talent in the volume by nature of uh, the contents displayed on the wall and the ceiling. And so we we looked at that and we're like, wow, that's really exciting. It provides uh, something that no one's ever seen before in support of Ted's mission of ideas worth spreading. And so we looked at, you know, XR LED, that's actually our, our studio where we shot, but take them back, Derek, and let's, let's show them the ILM. There we are. Okay, so there's the Mandalorian. Uh, nice, looks like they got a, like a dolly shot uh, on a jib. Um, but that is a very different form factor and experience than uh, what uh, our speakers would experience if they were in a green screen or, or a slight karama. Uh, and by nature of the sort of, I think the public's interest and enthusiasm uh, for that form factor, this is where we ended up deciding to sort of focus our time, effort and resources. So this is Studio Lab. Uh, it's a world-class facility uh, based up in Derry, New Hampshire. We're based here in Boston, so it's about 45 minutes north of us. Um, and, you know, Tim, Ben, Ian, John, Aaron, their whole team uh, warmly embraced as far as what we were doing very early in the pandemic as it relates to sort of a nice compliment to them going all in on XRLED. Uh, so these studios, I mean, we like to joke, you know, if, if Industrial Light and Magic ILM is the 1%, uh, what you're seeing here is uh, Orca Studios uh, in Spain. Um, the other one is Hyperbowl in uh, Germany. These are multi-million dollar installations. And so Studio Lab firmly falls within that camp associated with sort of the 10%. Uh, you're looking at probably a minimum investment of about $5 million to stand wow. up uh, an LED volume, as well as the equipment, lighting, optical tracking you need in order to sort of make this all work associated with fooling a camera into thinking that it's looking through an infinite world into infinite possibilities as well as obviously the, the lighting that you get from the LED volume that you'll never get from a green screen environment. So um, we decided to go all in. Uh, it is uh, it was a great time for us to do that associated with XR LED because you know we, we couldn't go to in person. Um, the world was still grappling and still actually is unfortunately with the, the long-term implications of the pandemic. And so we just use as an opportunity to dramatically expand the team. And we brought on board Lawrence and a lot of other, you know, phenomenal uh, talent and expertise. He's, he's already won an Emmy. Um, and we went to him and essentially said, Hey, we're, we're, we're an all volunteer team. We're going to go all in on XR LED. Uh, would you be interested in helping? And he essentially said, yes. So let me take a, a moment out. Like Lawrence, what, when I came knocking on your door, what did you make of this? Uh, because you, you were one of the few people that uniquely understood is like, what the heck? Like how crazy it was for us to like, 
make this sort of leap into the unknown. Well, yeah, when you came, when originally it was to do the green screen mixed reality stuff. So I've been doing that for you know years. Uh, my background's um, over the last 15 years doing virtual production before it was called that. You know, now it's great that it has a name because I can explain what I do. Um, but it's using effectively using real time rendering engines uh, and doing in, and executing live vir visual effects, virtual visual effects uh, composite with a live action, whether it's a, a live action talent that's keyed live over an environment that's all CG or the reverse. It's a live action backplate, live broadcast, and you're inserting uh, elements rendered from a real time rendering engine like unreal engine we've used many different ones in the past but unreal engine is obviously it's amazing so we're now being we're able to uh just really increase the visual quality of everything with the dawn of unreal with the dawn of the progression of nvidia's graphics card so it's awesome so when he came to me that was sort of the original ask and um one thing led to another and then that evolved to this led volume stuff which simultaneously he caught me when he, he was asking about that, I was actually working on these projects because I was evolving too. So um, it's for me as a virtual production director, it's, I never really want to go back. You know, I'm sure I will for certain reasons. It's great to use green screen, but uh, the, the organic nature of being able to shoot where you're seeing the visual effects live through camera, you know, we're, you'll also hear the term in camera VFX for that, same, that exact reason. It's just such a great way to work. You know, it's you're able to make great decisions, make sure that you have all the, the uh, angles you need and all the content you need. And you get to create happy accents because you never would have thought it would have looked that way until you actually moved the camera and, and caught it live. Um, so and, but I would say the best part of it all is just I think it was alluded to by Dimitri is the the talents, um, authenticity and their experience and their performance is, is heightened because they they're not in that scary uh, world that Dimitri talked about, they're actually in the world. So just they're, they're more natural. I was, we did a shoot, I can show you some shot, you know, show you the commercial, but um, we did a really awesome shoot with PSYOP uh, and with multiple celebrities, including Zed, the DJ. And he was on top of this, you know, uh, the shot was a high rise. He's on top in Vegas. He's overlooking the sunset. So um, when you walked into that volume, you saw the sunset, you actually felt like the serotonin levels increasing in your own head because you're like i just feel like i'm here and i'm not a performer so it just is a great thing so just that aside being able to get true refraction reflection and do all these do all these complicated sh shots that with green screen are so hard to get um it's just a great it's a great tool so i was really really happy that dimitri had sort of evolved his his desires to go into this world um, and, you know, there's always, and it's a very uh, infant world. There's still tons of tech being developed um, for the different you know, issues you have. But uh, there's a lot of pros that outweigh the cons, in my opinion. I mean, Dimitri, I want to go back to that decision. We're not talking like, hey, we're just going to take a mild step. We're talking, you're, you're talking these budgets that are just in the, the millions and tens of millions of dollars. What was was it you know was it a no-brainer from the beginning or when did you guys decide that hey green screen is just not good enough for what we need was was the you know there's an i know there's there's an analogy or a term you use for this that that uh will explain it better than me what the juice the juice is worth the squeeze that's one way of thinking about it um i think we approach it from a little bit of a different perspective so you know ted's been around for uh well over 35 years headquartered in new york they have their premier event in, in Vancouver. It's a week-long conference. I've been there. It's just spectacular. Uh, I'm an introvert, and at the end, I'm shattered and inspired at the same time. I come home, and my wife knows I need a couple of days just on the couch to, to read and like pull myself together. Um, we, by nature of being an all-volunteer team and, and producing you know, really remarkable ideas in the community, actually, Cambridge and Boston have sent more people to the TED Main stage than anywhere else on Earth, and I think we're mindful of just the extraordinary talent, organizational, academic, institutional resources that are concentrated here as part of sort of the higher education and innovation ecosystem. So one of the constraints that we embrace is that we were a show. We were only ever a show, an evening event. Um, we went all in on a handful of ideas and, and spent tens of thousands of hours preparing those handful of people to share their ideas on that stage in front of about 3,000 people uh, once a year as far as our, our premiere event. Um, and so what we realized is that, well, 
you know, we, we never approach this from a day long or a week long event. It's like, well, how do we bring, you know, the same commensurate level of production value, a 10 camera shoot into some sort of virtual realm. We also, we're on, you know, we're an all volunteer unpaid team and, and we live, breathe, survive and succeed uh, with the case studies that we establish with our, you know, with our world-class partners in which Panasonic has been a longstanding one. Beyond the 10 pro video cameras, we had five, you know, 20,000 uh, lumen three chip solid shine laser projectors. We completely laser mapped and projected the interior of the entire Boston Opera House for our 10th anniversary show. Um, so, you know, we roll deep, uh, but, but it's a function of celebrating, acknowledging our partners and focusing our community and our global audience on those handful of ideas. And so we decided, you know, no one really gets excited about green screen outside of meteorologists. If we were going to take, you know, all the frustration, the pain, the anxiety, the loss of the pandemic and, you know, do something hopefully profound and impactful and transformative, XR LED was what we were going to do. And so I, you know, we recruited the new team of which Lawrence is one of the key team, you know, key team members. Nicole, our producer, uh, she's also won an Emmy. Um, it was just every door I knocked on, I essentially said, we're going to go all in. We are burning the ships on XR LED. And to a, a woman and a man, everyone essentially said, how can I help? That's really bold. And so I think the boldness of the vision built off of our first decade and having gone through a radical organizational transformation to, you know, we will, we, we will live or die by our ability to make this transformation. It, it inspired not only our team, but our partners. And so we brought on board and opened a dialogue with, you know, Epic Games on Unreal Engine, NVIDIA as far as the GPUs, uh, Zeiss and Fuji for their XR LED glass. Uh, for, for Fuji, it's the... <clears throat> It's the uh, Fujinon Premista, uh, which is a world-class, you know, zoom lens, uh, and then the Supreme Primes from from you know uh, the team at Zeiss uh, to disguise associated with their media servers, and uh, everyone was like, "This is really exciting. What do you need?" And I was like, "We're gonna we're gonna you know build, collaborate with the Studio Lab team in Derry, New Hampshire, and test all this equipment and these workflows, in which we spent you know well over a year doing that." so that we could actually go in uh, to their, their LED volume last month and film the first XR LED TED Talks in the world. Um, and so you can share some of those, some of those images to, so people can wrap their head around you know, the before and after of what the LED volume looks like when it's all white versus some content on the wall. Um, and it was tremendously exciting uh, to be able to sort of do this. Um, and I think uh, even the speakers, uh, this was a really exciting transformational moment in their academic and professional lives to be able to go from a keynote deck into having their research, their ideas, their visual journeys represented on that wall and tracked in real time uh, to you know the camera. So you get beautiful parallax depth perspective, especially when it's on a jib or a dolly shot. Uh, I think you know I will preface this by saying it, this is extraordinarily difficult. There's a reason that you know ILM pioneered this technology several years ago and sort of premiered it. Um, not only in support of Star Wars, but primarily the Mandalorian with John Favreau's team out in California. So it's extraordinarily difficult. Um, but uh, as you essentially mentioned, you know the juice is worth the squeeze because once you master these workflows and you and you're you're collaborating with the equipment manufacturers in support of our vision of taking TED Talks, uh, which are universally well respected globally, and transforming that into a visually immersive experience with a direct to camera approach in a world-class XR LED volume at Studio Lab, it's a really exciting opportunity to sort of take it to the next level as it were. And so absolutely the juice is worth the squeeze, but I just wanna preface that by saying you have to have the right team, the right studio, the right partners and the right equipment to do this. There are indie versions of this. You can start with sort of, you know, Vive trackers, uh, but at the level that we're operating, we're at, you know, each one of those camera rigs that you see, and there's three in this photograph, between the glass, the tracking technology, uh, and the Veracam 35, each one of those rigs is a hundred grand, uh, and there's three of them in there. I already got people on my on my team sending me messages over here, like, "Hey, can we can we get that set up? Come on, what are we doing here? You guys got <laughs> got my team wanting this now." I have a very, a very beginner question here. So I, I'm sure somebody out there is thinking it as well. You know, you have this this cyclorama look. And, but obviously there's a separation, you know, when I think cyclorama, I think photo studio, you got the, the seamless wall there. How does, how do you guys work it in with between the floor and the actual backdrop there? Is that, 
What's the technical jargon behind that? Can we take that, Dimitri? I can do that. Far away, baby. Yeah, um, I'm, over the last six months, it's been a real creative challenge uh, for me um, because there's different techniques that we're all learning how to use. But the key, obviously, like you said, is trying to make that digital world and the practical world feel like it's together. So there's all kinds of different techniques you can use. Um, you know, the spatial is the first one, right? So when you're designing stuff, you can create, if you're using, if you're creating practical floor elements, you can create the design obviously where there's not, there's physical transitional pieces that can cover that. Um, when I worked on a project, the project I'd mentioned before, we we're doing a pinball world. So we designed a ramp that was right there practically. So you never saw that, right? Unless your camera was extremely angled, which you never would have been because the ceiling would have prevented that. Um, it, you know, you're actually making those worlds feel very similar. Lighting, massive, you know, that's a big time thing, trying to make the lighting of the both those worlds together uh, seamlessly. Um, uh, color science, making sure that the LUTs that you're using on the screen, you know, the, everything's calibrated correctly. Uh, the, the LUTs on your camera are correct. And it's all looking, uh, like I say, cohesive, that, which is a science all, all to itself. And then- Lawrence, can, uh, I, you, can I jump in? Can I jump in real quick? Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. No, no worries. How many, how many panels? I mean, when, when we see screens like this, we normally, to people like me, it's like, well, is that all one giant LED panel? Is it a you know a thousand panels put together? What are we looking at as, as far as a screen like that? Yeah, that one. I'm not. I can't remember how many actually there were. That was what a forty foot. It's. I think the the Studio Lab dimensions are fifty fifty two feet linearly on an arc. It's about thirty five feet um, across as far as the the endpoints and about fifteen feet high. Um, there they use. Uh, like a 2.9 pixel pitch uh, professional LED uh, panel. Uh, so they're rectangular, not square. Uh, how many actual panels? I'm not sure. Uh, but here's a, here's a perfect lesson that Lawrence can say. That's not a curve, though. Those are, <laughs> those are like 40 planes. And if you don't map it appropriately and you manage like the color values and the light field mapping, uh, you're going to get into deep, deep trouble uh, when you're trying to match the virtual world with the real world. So, so that is, it rules. looks like a curve. It is technically not. And you need to know that going so it's in. All flat planes. And so when you talk about like the calibration, is it like, well, if I have this at an angle, you know, this green is not going to be match this green. So I have to calibrate this green to look the same as yeah, is that so what we're talking use, about here. They use disguise and disguise has a lot of tools built in that um, helps that calibration. And they keep on developing newer ones. Disguise came from the world of like live events, LED projections. And so now with this, it's kind of a natural fit and they're, they're creating new markets for themselves, you know, but it's pretty much figuring out where those panels are in the 3D world and re relative to the camera position. So it's really important to have telemetry, which is the, the data of where that camera is positionally in that 3D world to scale. And there's all sorts of different companies doing that. Um, and in this particular studio, it's OptiTrack. So it's like a, an OptiTrack is a, a, a motion capture um, you know, outward in, right? Which is cameras, infrared cameras all around the perimeter looking at marks. So you can see in that picture there, I think we call that Sputnik. It's like a bunch of rods all on a rigid body that they know where all those things are. They know the offset of that based off the rotation of the camera and its nodal point. And so it can actually track that camera in real time. You could also put another one of those on someone's head and run around and it'll actually track that to the camera too. You know, so that's what's great about using a motion control system. There are systems out there like Stipe and um, NCAM and Moses that are actually uh, inward out, meaning it's looking at marks like a star pattern from the camera, which is actually another camera on top of the camera. So it's like a witness camera that's stuck to that camera, looking at the star map and sort of doing trigonometry and figuring out where it is. The key is that everything's synced together, that the rendering engine in this case, Unreal, um, which is being piped, uh, which is being orchestrated by um, disguise. It needs to all be a time the same, so that the render the renderer is rendering exactly the same frames of that camera as that moment. And then that camera is actually um, the the ang the the camera that's rendering in Unreal is is being controlled by the real camera. So it's projecting onto those panels its own view, and that's the key. That's how you're getting these LED volumes. Uh, so like when you're um, Carrie Underwood, or in this case, you're you know one of the presenters, 
you're actually looking at the, when the camera's moving, you're actually looking at the content kind of swirling, you know, and it's a little messed up, but from the camera's point of view, it looks awesome because we know it's field of view and uh, all these other highly technical. So, things. so if you're looking out on a monitor, you're not seeing what no. the camera or what the software is seeing. It's a little weird. Like you, even in these pictures here, that's, you know, it doesn't look exactly right, you know, yeah. but through the camera, it looks great. So um, yeah. So there's a, um, there's different, there's other ways to tr help that transition, Derek, you can use animation. So we, you can use animated uh, practical elements and then they're actually synced to the digital ones. And then you can continue the animation through that world. So you're leading your eye from the um, practical world into that digital world. You know, there's lighting techniques when lights, uh, we use DMX as well. So DMX uh, lighting can also, uh, lighting panels can control Unreal Engine's digital versions of their lights sit in sync so you can do really cool things too lawrence why don't why don't you show them because this is a great point uh we've talked a lot of technology and a lot about the workflow but you want to show them the the psyops uh commercial yeah uh, yeah, yeah that's a great application because we're not able to sort of uh even tease the videos that are coming we're still in post-production but this is a great opportunity for lawrence to show the world uh, i think arguably the world's first xr led commercial that you worked on with psyops yeah and then also the BTS behind the scenes that shows some of these elements. And I think, I yeah, think it's really cool. Uh, the B&H audience is really going to enjoy this. You guys see this? Uh, good good yeah. morning, fabulous. Yeah. Okay, cool. I think I've seen this before, Lawrence. Yeah, it's, we did it. Um, we worked on it from January through March and shot in March, I believe. Um, it so, showed in April, I around April? I mean, it was April, yeah. It was, it was our, great because they, they brought me in two months early, so we really got everything planned out in a really great way. It was awesome. So it was a really cool project. And they just came out with the behind the scenes uh, edit, edit, so I want to show you that too. It was on LinkedIn, so it's great. Awesome. Here we go. And this is the director's cut. I worked with uh, the director was uh, Marco Spear. He's the, the founder of PSYOP. So the goal here was to create their first, they do live action. They came from an animation studio background. They've obviously done tons of commercials, amazing high-end uh, commercials using CG and live action in a very stylistic way. But this was their first soiree into using virtual production. So um, it was a great, it was, we got to work with amazing people, art directors, creating production, real produ uh, art directed um, uh, set pieces. And watch how you can't tell the difference between the set pieces and the digital world because of all the different transitional stuff we worked on. Let's check this out. Oh, this is for Resort World, which is a new uh, amazing hotel resort in Vegas. And they, um, um, they got six celebrities to be part of this, which was awesome. <laughs> That was that. 
And we're, so that, we're going to drop a link to that on, on YouTube, Lawrence, so that we know that it's Zoom. We, we don't want Lawrence's work to be the product of showing it on Zoom. So if you guys want to check that out uh, in full, it's, it's full splendor. Definitely check that out. We're going to drop a link there for those of you out there watching in the virtual realm. Yeah, so that was, um, we worked with Nance Studios um, and that, uh, which is, we were, I think, the first production at Nance Studios, which is this amazing, um, and it looks like going to an amazing uh, LED stage. Was four, I think it was 40, the diameter was 40 uh, feet, but it had like 25 foot ceilings and it had like a horseshoe shape. So uh, the key was doing tech viz from the beginning. I'd, I'd really sold that. I'm like, because we had like six environments, very short uh, production time to turn these sets around. So um, everything that went into the planning of this was with the virtual, this virtual production uh, pipeline in mind, knowing that the key is pre-lighting, right? Usually pre-lighting takes, you know, a day for everything. Um, but this requires more because you're trying to pre-light two worlds to blend together. So I, you know, we, we really pushed on that. So we had two days to do that. Um, but we also got the set, all oh, the sets were extensive. So the sets were all built like floats, kind of like Rose Bowl on wheels. So they would wheel them in, we pre-light, wheel them out, save all our settings, save all our DMX lighting setups and stuff. Um, and that was a great workflow. Um, we planned the entire thing. Everything was tech vised out. Um, all the shot design uh, was done ahead of time. All the pre-planning and everything was, so a lot of times you'll do pre this first, like the creative shots, the creativity, and, and you don't really care about the practical uh, ramifications. I don't do that. I, I create all every, everything within the real world constraints. So I, I create with tech this. So I'm, I kind of like blend those two things because there's no time. So doing that was actually great because the art department came on um, fairly late in the process. And we were able to just like, give them all the specs right off the bat from Unreal Engine, like the size of the, the, the area of which they need to create practical uh, sets and stuff. So it was really good and very great. And my whole thing was, it's, you don't feel like as a director that you're sort of pigeonholed into this, uh, where you're not getting, taking advantage of the technology in a creative way, because at least now you know you're going to get the shots you plan for. And because you're organized, you now can actually have some time to freestyle, which we did. And so if you were to look at the tech viz and look at what finally happened, it wasn't the same. There was tons of similarities, but you know, it was a great process. And I always tell people the best part of the whole thing was because you're not shooting on a green screen. So this wasn't live. This was like live to tape to post. And so you, typically it's like six week turnaround, two months for a commercial and post. This was predominantly done in pre, which is something you really need to know in going into this kind of thing. And, and Dimitri can testify to that you're really putting your money and your time in pre-production and then you're saving a little bit of time in the end just for little you know little tweaks and polish and putting the lipstick on the pig you know which is what he said so you know uh there's like two weeks of just comping like a little flame work here and there to you know those we shot with uh carry underwood we'll see it was a really cool like marley gold floor and then the 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 water in the digital world was rippling. So in flame, they made a little bit of ripples. That was really nothing. So, and the key was because we're putting the money in there, the big flaw would be to spend money in post too, because you made mistakes. And then virtual production mm -hmm. really wouldn't be that great of a thing. So we definitely made sure that, that didn't happen. It was, it was very successful when it came to like virtual production as a, as a tool and a workflow, it's successful. We got a lot of good out of it. So backtrack, the best part of it was in the end, when we're drinking, you know, champagne and we're celebrating. This is a great end. You know, we're wrapping out. Um, they wheeled in a television and we saw the whole commercial. Like it could have aired, you know, without all the right. There. It was beautiful. It was, just, it was great. Everybody's like, Oh my God, it's amazing because the workflow is you're, you're shooting it. You're shooting all the VFX the same exact time about 10 seconds later, it's living in premiere and you're editing it. So you're actually finding out what the flaws are your flaws are of the story and the coverage you haven't gotten so when you go to bed that night you're like oh this is, you're not stressing at all well not that much but you know way less so i'll show you here's oh, go ahead uh, yeah when, when you're pulling it up um we we did have a question regarding the vfx portion how hard is it to combine the vfx with what is real as from like the lighting perspective it's like almost like you know if you're going to photoshop somebody into an image you have to make sure the light is the same color same quality same direction all of that is it 
way easier than we're thinking about it or that we're making it out to be, or is it really super difficult to combine the, B the VFX backgrounds with what is real? In this case, I'm guessing it's just the subjects and the props, right? Yeah, well, exactly. So in some ways, it, it's great to, this studio had a really large LED ceiling, which typically isn't the, the pixel pitch of everything else. So it's not great to have on camera. Um, but in the end, because there's so many pixels, it's, it's so, so amazing contributing to the ambient light and speculum reflections. So the way that they had that set up was they had an iPad and the uh, DP that we're working with was pretty much amazing. And uh, he was from the Mandalorian season two. And he, uh, he was a, the cinematographer of Wonder Woman one and two. So uh, he had experience on there. So he had an iPad and when he was lighting, he's using, we're using the real pixels from Unreal. And it's lighting the world just naturally. But if you want to uh, emphasize certain areas with light, you bring you this uh, interface. You could drop square or circle white cards, feather them, soften them, and like you're literally just changing the lighting on the fly. You know, he had his own package. He had you know his grip there. I mean, sorry, his, his gaffer, and he had a team. But I would assume there's way less lights that um, are set up than are necessary or that would there um this allows for less package of lights so uh but those are all dmx as well so what we had was two lighting boards and this is kind of new to the whole film world too so in, in commercial world in fact this world comes from the live event world and the broadcast world so these two all these worlds are coming together so i pushed for it and i said we based on my experience in this with there when there's a lot of lights digital lights to make changes, it's not easy in Unreal. It's, it's you're opening up the keyframes. It's, it just isn't going to work. So creating a rig and a system that's attached to DMX, you're giving that, that job to the people who do it anyway, like the lighter. So you're you're making them happier that they're part of this whole process. But then you're also giving them some jobs of triggering animations too, because that's great on a panel as well. So that used to be another job. Some like an operator who'd have a panel and hit he he would actually trigger the um the cues too. But now I'm trying to put all that on the, the lighting guy. So the direct, the DP wanted to bring in his own lighter for the talent, which is cool. He had a hog board. And then we brought in our own uh, guy on a, for all the digital lighting on a grand MA. And so in the end, the grand MA was the master. And when, during the actual production, he would trigger the um, cues that would also trigger the cues that was set by the DP's guy. So it was awesome. So that really helped with the syncing every, everything to answer your question. So it, during those pre-light sessions is where all the magic's happening. Now, having a VFX background is essential too, because you have to understand how all this works in the VFX land, right? You, have, you, know, you need to understand uh, how to set up the, you know, the, um, the color, ACES color, and make sure all the color is the same in all these different places, whether it's the camera, whether it's just the digital screens, or whether it's Unreal's rendering capabilities and the record too right so uh there's a lot going on there and then um they brought in, uh nant brought in their guys to do all that on a weekend to make sure it was all like completely synced and beautiful so nant was awesome as well um and then we had some really talented guys from uh i brought in this company called erg uh they're out of vegas who also helped us build all these unreal environments so their artists were there uh, an interesting thing was their uh lighting director was there who had, and i didn't know this we had dj tso was one um the one of the celebrities and in his world that you might have seen with all the you know, pipe organs there was 150 digital lighting fixtures there and the the lighting director they brought i didn't know this but he had worked in vegas for dj tso show for a year so if there's anybody more authentic at animating his lighting was him so that was such an awesome you know like plus you know because we knew that he, you know, that talent wouldn't really have any issues. So it was great. And that was key in making everything awesome because when the director, when Marco was like, oh, I want like more of a red cue, it's like, mm -hmm, like literally like five seconds, everything turns red and different animations happen. So it was amazing. So That's this, awesome. this behind the scenes, you'll see all that, but there was really a, a really cool moment where, you know, in the interest of trying to make everything in pre-production, there was a there was a shot with Luke Bryan, who was actually going to be fishing off of a boat. And so normally you'd wrap the and it was on a base, like a pedestal. And we're in uh, visual effects, you would wrap it with green, you'd key it out, roto it, whatever. But we didn't have that liberty. 
And so, you know, we were thinking about doing that. And I was like, no, man, let's really do this in, in camera. Let's really innovate and try and figure this out. So I came up with this idea because uh, I have a compositing background. Why, if we can actually, we know where all those LED screens we talked about were, you know, in space relative to the camera. What if we put LED band-aids in the foreground in front of stuff, project onto that, wouldn't that actually erase effectively the talent that's behind it or the practical elements that's behind it. So I naturally thought that the guys who worked on Mandalorian had employed these techniques for like years, but they're like, no, we've never done that. I'm like, oh God, it's probably isn't going to work. So, uh, but their Nan was awesome. They were down with the challenge. So over a weekend, they built the whole thing out and tested it. And we're like, holy shit, it works. So uh, it was, wow. that was awesome. You'll see that here. A lot of the behind the scenes, you'll see this panel being built. It's actually covering up the practical rigging and projecting the water through it live. And so that, it was really great because you could get that Sputnik I talked about and you could pull it from the camera, walk around with it and the screens would update based on your view. And it felt like you were in a, um, in a big aquarium when you walked. So you'll see us right here. So this is the behind the scenes. Wow. Syop's passion for merging art and technology fueled the world's first commercial film entirely realized by virtual production. As the first property to open on the Las Vegas Strip in over a decade, Resorts World saw an opportunity to show its brand of innovation and technology in a new and exciting way. Always wanted to work with Syop, and Syop pitched the Unreal Engine, and we were just blown away by the technology, what it can do, and the look. Psyop leveraged their design prowess and CG capabilities to build highly stylized worlds that carefully blurred the line between physical and digital on a massive scale. They teamed up with Man Studios, a leader in the virtual production space, using techniques honed on productions like The Lion King and Mandalorian. Virtual production at its core is a tool for bringing digital worlds to life during the shoot. PSYOP streamed their designs onto a curved LED wall made from hundreds of screens that surround the stage, thus creating an immersive environment to shoot in that reacts in real time to camera movement and lighting changes. In contrast to traditional digital techniques, virtual production encourages a more iterative process where the entire team can collaborate on creative decisions while shooting and not have to wait to see it put together in post. I have always been trying to blend animation and live action since we started PSYOP. We are world creators. Having the ability to be in that world was always some sort of a fantasy of mine. A lot of times when you're just working with a green screen, you're looking at absolutely nothing and trying to make sure in your head what it is. This actually gives me things to look at and interact with. You know, when the camera shakes around, the, the image changes, the lighting changes, the reflection. It's really amazing to, to see this in action. Virtual production is the next logical step in the ongoing evolution of filmmaking, and Syop is proud to be leading the way. That's mind blowing. Yeah, I, I don't think I fully grasped. You know that that behind the scenes gives you a much better idea for what you guys were talking about before about how everything is reactive. Like just thinking about like you don't even really think about the background changes, you know, perspective changes and just the, the compression or, or the perceived compression and how your eye, you know, processes what you see. That's it. I don't even have words. It's, it's mind blowing. Derek, you kind of have to know how to design it, right? Creative freedom, right? It's like Lawrence and I think about this from the perspective. It's like, if you put the time in, you put the effort, you build the right team and the partners, um, it's like you, you essentially become Neo in the matrix. Like you can bend reality to your will. And as like a DP or cinematographer <clears throat> or a lighting designer to be able to look at it and in real time, shift it, tweak it, edit it, uh, or have the confidence as far as like putting the substantial amount of effort. And I will reiterate to what you, what Lawrence said, like, this is a really, you know, tech viz, pre-viz, pre-production heavy, uh, sort of workflow. But the beauty is like, you have confidence coming out of the studio, you've got it, it's in the can, or with the time you got left to you, now what can we do, right? I mean, there were moments when we were in the studio, studio lab where we've already got it, we know it's done. It's like, what else do we wanna explore? Let's, let's, let's throw on some different glass. Let's, let's explore, you know, some different dolly or some gym shots. Um, you would never be able to do that in, in green screen, 
because it's just an entirely different workflow. So the same thing that appeals to, you know, Carrie Underwood in that video, as far as just the confidence and the comfort of being able to sort of interact with that, uh, that sort of visually immersive sort of studio environment, the same thing applies to our speakers. And so knowing that they're coming from an academic and research background, it allows them to have that level of comfort and authenticity so that they can take, you know, this audience on like a visually immersive journey in service of their research or their idea in the same way that you're seeing associated, you know, this really remarkable commercial that let Lawrence participated on as far as like that new hotel in Vegas. And so um, I would, I would warmly encourage people to explore and learn a little bit more about this. Uh, we're happy to be sort of a supportive resource. I think with the time we've got left as far as specific questions, but I think the power of this is, is that there is enormous creative destruction coming uh, in the best possible sense of the world and traditional silos or traditional workflows are being like blown up by the month. Um, you know, the technology that we're exploring now, especially with like Zeiss and Fujinon with their like extended data XD workflow, as far as pulling all of the real time data, lens encoding data out of the lens and ingesting it in real time into the engine that actually puts like set extensions in volume, final pixel augmented reality onto the table is, is mind blowing. And so, um, you know, I think when we first started this exploration a year ago, there were a handful of these stages. Now there's over 200 XR LED stages available in the world. All of them, you know, you're looking at probably a three to $5 million capital investment uh, and tens, if not hundreds of hours of wrestling the workflows because there's, there's enormous amounts of equipment involved and they all need to be integrated. And there's different flavors and versions of this, different camera tracking solutions, inside out, outside in, full volumes, roofs, floors, uh, elbows, curves, um, you know, it's just, it's a really exciting time. And I would encourage people uh, to sort of learn more, get involved, find out where local studios are. Um, right now, everyone's, it's a highly collaborative environment, but it's also an opportunity to like just experiment. And the, the creative opportunity is, it's like I said, at the end of the day, for those sorts of teams or, or studios or content creators, you essentially like become Neo in the matrix. Uh, and that's the real power. And that's allows you to sort of creatively flex once you figure this out, um, the ability to change that content or to shoot, you know, one of the most powerful things associated with that ILM making, uh, making of with, with uh, Mandalorian is the DP talking about shooting a 10 hour dawn, like magic hour. That's mind blowing if you're a DP to be able to just go in there and shoot 10 hours of dawn footage. You could do that. Yeah. It's just spectacular. So, you know, Derek, questions that you've got or you want to source from the audience, uh, we're all ears. We want to be, you know, get through as much as possible. Hopefully there's there's lots of questions sort of flying yeah. around out there. Definitely. I do want to second that. Get your questions in. Like you have no better time to ask. Like I said earlier, these guys are a wealth of knowledge. Um, I, I want to go back because we did have a question and you kind of just touched upon the idea there with the human element with Carrie Underwood. But we had a question come in about your experience with since you know you said you just did you just wrapped your first virtual TEDx Cambridge event what was it like for the talent responding to this new technology I mean I, I liken it to like with us taking going from live to virtual events I've had multiple people who are like I'm looking at a screen I don't see people there's no like interactive element of having humans on the other side what was your what did you notice, Dimitri, about how the live talent responded to the technology? Uh, good question. Uh, actually, take us out of the, so I can see you and Lawrence, because right now yeah, uh, we're still in down. presentation format. Um, I would say um, we did everything we could to provide them sort of photographs of the volume, the content on the wall. Lawrence, you know, was aware of all this. But it, uh, it actually reminds me a lot uh, and this will probably resonate with a lot of your audience. It's like the first Cirque du Soleil show you ever went to. You're like, ah, it's some sort of circus thing. It's like, whoa, like now second or third or fourth or fifth Cirque, it's like, ah, you know, the, the, the acrobats in the first one were better than the, you know, you become jaded, but nothing can really prepare you for the first time you walk into an XR LED volume or stage or studio environment. It's just jaw dropping and never more so than when Lawrence was talking about it. If you can do a side by side between what you're seeing on the wall displayed versus what the camera's capturing. Uh, because like that, that, that false perspective, that parallax depth perspective um, is just mind blowing. It's, it's like, if, especially from the sides, it's like looking at like a Salvador Dali painting, everything's totally screwed up. But from the perspective of the camera, it's like, oh, it's it, like, you can't tell that it's not there. And outside, you know, you, there's always, as Lawrence knows, you know, there's more issues, there's bokeh issues. You've got to sort of design around. It's not perfect and flawless yet. Uh, there's still constraints. 
you know, the smaller pixel pitch, the better, uh, because it helps avoid and provide, you know, flexibility when it comes to sort of more beginning to sort of materialize, you know, the quality of the camera and image sensor, as well as the glass that you've got makes a huge Jeff, you know, the, the reason that we're using cinema cameras versus broadcast is we want that shallow depth of field. That is absolutely our friend. Uh, broadcast cameras are a different look and a different sort of visual aesthetic, um, but um, it's just so much fun. So they were prepared, but everyone's jaw, uh, if they're honest, the first time you go into the volume, it's lit up. You're seeing content sort of roll through, or like if you do a real big move on a jib, it's just everyone's minds are blown. <laughs> <laughs> Now, now, what about you? You touched a little bit there, Dimitri, on some of the challenges. Is there any what, what challenges from what you're seeing so far, or Lawrence, if if you want to chime in on this as well? As far as you know, we're coming here for the benefits and the plentiful benefits. But what are still some of the challenges that you're seeing at the time of recording with this new technology? Uh, just Lawrence, what have you noticed? Oh yeah, uh, edu uh, education of producers and clients. Uh, they need to know that there needs to be more lead time, um, that their schedules that they've been working on for years, you know, their formulas have to change, uh, their money, where the money is going to go, their budgets have to change, what they're allowing for. Uh, technically, um, in, in those different segmentations of knowledge, there's like production, there's uh, camera, lighting, but uh, definitely... Um, because we're dealing with real-time rendering, there's the whole CG pipeline. It's different, right? It's, uh, under, so you have like really high quality filmic commercial pipelines. They're typically rendering things in post on render farms. Now they're all learning Unreal Engine and they have to understand how to create slightly differently for a game engine. You can't just throw something that looks good in Arnold or V-Ray or whatever and throw it into Unreal and expect it to work great in real time. You'll, you because the it's very, there's no tolerance for one frame um difference so you might go all right well this is a 30 frame a second uh piece right uh once in a while it hits 29 or 28 that's a no it's game over because that at that moment the gag is over the camera tracking goes like this and now you gotta do posts you know so you have to, you have to teach how to optimize and how you know all the different rules of creating all that content so that it plays out you know, so it's, it's a different, it's like where gaming, it's a complete place where games and visual effects come together. And in this world, it's broadcast engineering, really. You know, it's display, it's, oh, it's, it's live event too. It's all these, this, this, this sprocket of different, uh, you know, um, experience and disciplines or I'm meeting them all, you know? Mm -hmm. So now, now being that it is all those things, well, it seems to be a, uh, a popular question on YouTube right now from our people joining us from YouTube. How do you get your foot in the door? How do you be, get on a team like this? Where do you start? I guess it depends on where you're at. So if you're, if you're in camera, right. Then start understanding camera, camera telemetry technologies. Cause that's going to be on you to make sure you understand that. If you're a jib operator, you need to understand what's on your jib and the weight and the things that, uh, and the lens uh, encoding that happens. Um, lighting it's, you know, we had an awesome DP, Dave, um, we call him DP Dave. What was his last name, Dimitri? Boulay. <laughs> uh, yeah. So Boulay, right? Yep. Yeah. He was awesome. So he's just, his, uh, thirst to want to understand this world was awesome. I mean, he was pretty much, he was way beyond a, a DP for this, in my opinion. And he understood the technology. He did, he did the tech viz for this project with Dimitri he understood the limitations. He learned the limitations and, you know, how you don't want to have light hit the screens because all of a sudden now you're actually seeing the facets of the LEDs giving away the gag. You're seeing the, you know, the reflections of those LEDs. You don't see a nice clean environment anymore. Um, you don't want the talent to get too close because now if you're using shallow depth of field, they're too close to the screen. So now they, if they're in focus, so is the screens. And now you get the more which is this like more effect. So, you know, we have rules like don't go close, don't have the town closer, like eight feet away. Uh, make sure you're shooting like like uh, Dimitri said, shallow to the field. So every single discipline has to understand their role. So no matter where you're coming from, it's you have to understand your role. And and just uh, like there's so many great um, behind the scenes and explanation uh, PDFs out there via LinkedIn. Um, it's there's so many places to learn from, you know. 
I, I, the hallmark of all this is, is that like no one's an expert. Don't don't trust anyone if they essentially said they're, they're crushing it, they're killing it, they're they're a virtual yeah. production. They're all full of shit. Uh, we're barely <laughs> scratching the surface. I think yeah, we don't take ourselves very 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 seriously. I mean, we're 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 busting our our asses uh, as best we can as a volunteer, you know, unpaid team. But we're super hungry. We're super thirsty to learn. If you've got you know people out there who want to come collaborate with us that bring something special, unique. Uh, you know, we're, we're all ears. We're, we're testing some new technology here. That's like really bleeding edge. Uh, cause people want to lean in. They want to help out. They want to get involved. Um, we've got great partners in studio lab up in, up in New Hampshire. If, if anyone on this is watching in New England, I highly recommend reaching out to them. Uh, you know, Tim and Ben and Ian and Aaron and, and, and their whole team, John happy to sort of give you a tour. It's, it's also a co-working facility. They've got a rec- recording studio. They've got a green screen psychorama. They've got an LED volume. They've got, uh, they've got all the toys up there. It's so much fun to go hang out with those guys. But it's at the end of the day, it's like technicians and artists coming together to essentially say, this stuff is so cool. No one has all the answers. I think that's, you know, we're working with both Zeiss and Fuji because they're both using Zeiss's XD lens encoding format to sort of push, you know, so here before people might be competitors, actually everyone's sort of figuring this out right now. It's a really exciting time. I think that that collaborative opportunity, it's sort of akin to leveraging sort of the, you know, the, the Vegas ad that Lawrence, it's like a roulette wheel. You can kind of be in anything, right? You need to bring something to the table in order to proactively sort of like, you know, carry your, carry your own weight or your salt as it were. But all of these studios are really collaborative, very open. Uh, producers are wrapping their heads around this. DPs are cinematographers. I would also say we've spent so much time on the visually immersive nature of this. You need great fucking audio too. Uh, so you need an awesome A1 or a sound engineer. Uh, you need multiple mics. You need <laughs> because uh, good point, beyond Dimitri. like our our 4K, you know, 444 12-bit, you know, V-log workflow. We're also mastering all this and doing sound design in Dolby Atmos, like 7.1.4. So, you know, we're we're creating both a visually as well as an auditorily immersive sort of experience in support of sort of transforming what people think a TED Talk can be. Uh, and so what you saw with the BTS that Lawrence did with, with Resorts World, now that's essentially a blank check, uh, sort of, you know, $6 billion casino ad, we're never going to be there, but we aspire to have that level of production value. And bit by bit, we're sort of working towards towards that goal. And so, I think if anything, you know, the water's warm. There are hundreds of these studios. Find them. Uh, find people they're working in there. Uh, a lot of the operators are like, "Come check out my stuff." They're a little terrified because they've spent millions of dollars during a pandemic to sort of spin up one of these operations. Um, it is just a, it is an unbelievable toolbox. And like I said, there's a lot of really interesting creative destruction happening right now, or the debalkanization or the de-siloing of here to store, here to for really specific functional roles that relates to broadcast, live events, film, and cinema. It's all starting to blend now, and it's a really exciting team. Uh, art direction too. Professionals as well as young ones too. Don't forget art direction. If there's anybody on this call that's in the art direction, like you, you know, it's amazing. I loved working with uh, the art directors. We're just like, oh my God, because they're seeing the digital extensions of what they're actually building. And it's also great synergy that goes on there, you know, from, hey, let's use bubbles to see what happens in the, in this, you know, the LED volume and see if it reflects. This is really cool, uh, awesome exploration that happens and experimentation. So there's a, definitely a role for you there. Back to the audio, there are definitely things that you need to know doing audio. Like uh, Dimitri, remember the echoing, the, the way the, uh, the sound bounces in the LED volume was problematic. So there had to be some adjustments there. So there's all sorts of different things that are amazing and things that are problematic. And you just have to learn in your own little world and your own role, how to deal with them, you know? It's, it's about well, knocking out anything that like al- allows people, like we, we want to stay outside the uncanny vill- valley, like moray or bokeh or like shallow depth of field or like light spilling on the wall or seeing the individual facets or, or you know, sound issues. Because what essentially happens is it takes you out of the moment and you start becoming like a critic of how they shot it or something doesn't quite look right, especially like a dropped frame or the track, the optical tracking isn't working perfectly. So there's an enormous amount of work to, to ensure that you don't see those flaws or you don't hear those things uh, so that you're actually true to the full potential creative vision. But ultimately uh, everyone in this industry, particularly XR LED is, is all focused on like in-camera visual effects, final pixel so that you're just doing some touch up or you're just doing a grade. Uh, we're not there yet, 
but we're getting closer to that. And it's a really exciting opportunity. And truly it's, it's like Neo in the matrix. You can then just use those volumes as far as infinite worlds into telling whatever story that you want. And that is so tremendously powerful, regardless of your medium, your form, or even your audience. Dimitri, I think you have everybody driving up to New Hampshire right now. Uh, hey, Jordan, go, go to Derry, New Hampshire. These guys are so freaking cool. <laughs> they are Jordan cool. Their Chase, space is Jordan awesome. Chase I love is on our kid. YouTube. Jordan Chase is on YouTube right now. He says he's 10 minutes from Derry. So you're the winner right there. You, you got the shortest drive. So go make it happen. Um, I do want to get into one more question. And I want to remind everybody, August 30th, we're going to be back with a more advanced, um, a, a deeper dive into all this XRLED stuff. So I do want to invite everybody back. And if there's anybody who has a cinema background, anybody who is, has background in, in VFX or anything, even if you're just interested in it, it's going to take today's interest level, which is giving me chills right now. I learned so much. So I want to thank you guys, but we're taking it to another level. So I want to personally invite everybody back August 30th. Um, but we're going to get one more question in here we'll before I let you guys the go. The Studio Labs uh, director of virtual production on the call so that he and, and Lawrence can take a really deep dive into the technology, the cameras, the optical tracking, the pixel pitch, wall dimensions, uh, you know, lens encoding. We'll, we'll take a much deeper dive into like, you know, what goes into like a $100,000 camera rig in order to do this really well. Definitely. So our, our final question is coming in from Matt, who's joined us from live stream. Has anybody used the off-camera axis to get, as you said, the Salvador Dali weird backgrounds as a visual background? I, well, I mean, obviously you only notice it if you're in like the wings of the volume and you're like, wow, that looks really weird. You would never want to like, that would be so visually distracting. But I don't know, Lawrence, has anyone purposely like turned off or you'd only get that from like a camera B or a side profile have you seen anyone actually use that? Uh, I mean, right. stylistically, it's like really on purpose. Weird to I guess, see it. I guess stylistically. Yeah, I, I haven't actually seen that. But like a lot of these cool artifacts, we always laugh about. Like if you if you were to look at, uh, there's a shot for um, the the pipe organ scene with DJ Chesto, and uh, we actually we looked at the ceiling, and it wasn't bad. And, but you saw the lights coming, they, they took out LEDs. So you saw these holes with spotlights in there. And at the end of the day, we're like, it's kind of cool. Like it's not right, but at the end of the day, it's aesthetically, it's kind of neat. We dropped some volumetric fog on that and call it a day, you know? So um, there's a lot of cool things that you get that are artifacts that people hate. But if you really pump up the problem and call it art and you commit <laughs> to it, then I think to that thought the, with the Dolly, you know, you, you could do, totally do it. And you'd probably make a lot of like Ian's in the world be happy because you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 I'm sure some of this stuff too is I would never notice it. I did. Like I said, I watched, I saw the commercial actually months ago before this event was even a thing. Never would have, never would have crossed my mind. Never, but as people who yeah. are working on it and, and who know it, you see it, you notice it. And once you see it, you can't unsee it. I worked on a project with Madonna with volumetric capture and there was a whole bunch of things. I was like, Oh my God, we gotta get rid of that. We gotta clean it. Uh, it's te technically anybody in the industry would be like, Oh dude. But she was like, I love it. Let's make more of it. I'm like, Oh no. <laughs> What's up? Hey man, whatever floats your boat stylistically, I would do it. That's it. That's it. Well, look, this has been awesome. I wish I could sit here and talk to you guys all day. It really is just super entertaining it's not just me who sees it, but you know, the, the comments are pouring in on YouTube, live streaming, Facebook, that you guys' excitement about the technology is just infectious. So I want to thank Dimitri, Lawrence, uh, the whole team at Panasonic, Gregor, and everybody over there at the pro video and cinema side. Any last words, you guys? I would say like, don't let anything that we've spoken today intimidate you. Like I didn't know shit about this 12 months ago, like nothing. Uh, and the water's warm. Uh, anyone that pretends that they're an expert, they don't know what the hell they're talking about. Like there are some really phenomenally talented images out there. Don't get me wrong. Um, but uh, now's a great time to get involved. If you're, if you're young, uh, you've, you've got a tech background or you're like one of the trades that's critical to doing this, like uh, learn more online, figure out where the local facilities are. You know, SCAD, Savannah Carl, Carl Jordan Design is just spinning up a volume down in, in Georgia so that they can start teaching students this stuff. It's, it's going to become part of like curricula in universities that have premier 
sort of film, television, VFX uh, sort of programs. Uh, but and even if you're, you know, established uh, profession in the industry, now's a great time to kind of like go back to school as it were, or get involved in some of these projects. But uh, I don't want anything that we've shared today to intimidate anyone from learning more. There's a ton of good stuff and resources and guides online, get involved. There are now, I guarantee you, a lot of the people who are watching us, there's probably a few volumes within 50 to 100 miles of you, particularly if you live in New York, LA, uh, you know, London, Tokyo, uh, you know, Singapore, Shanghai, they're there. Um, and by and large, pretty much anyone who has a facility like that, I've found to be extremely open and they want to give you tours and learn more. Um, it's just the water's really warm and there's just so much creative opportunity. Uh, inherent in these new volumes and these new workflows. So get involved. Um, Lawrence, thoughts as far as what you've what you've experienced in your own journey over the last sort of you know couple of years transitioning into this this uh, this production workflow. I don't know. It's more. Mine's probably more just like Tibet monk, you know, ten thousand foot statements. But you know, I'm working on really cool stuff. Working with TEDx is like you know such an awesome thing, and and just working in my career. You know, and don't ever let anybody tell you you can't, it sounds so cliche, I hate to say it, but I mean, it's from like, so my you know deepest heart, don't ever let someone go, oh, you know, you'll never do that. Or, hey, do you okay? You know, stick to your lane, whatever. Just jump out of the lane and do it. And then once you start doing it, tell yourself, tell the universe that you're going to do this and you're going to do this and get paid. And then it'll eventually happen if you love it and it's fun and you keep, you know, that's absolutely what would happen. So for that who so the person that's working in camera and wants to direct or the person that wants who's working in you know is a video shader and wants to actually start using unreal to make artwork just do it and then you'll so you'll post posts on linkedin and something like oh my god it's amazing and you'll get your shot awesome well hey we'll leave it there on an inspirational note just get out there and do it everybody uh, again huge thank you to panasonic TEDx Cambridge and everybody who on both teams that really made all this stuff happen and is the reason we're here talking about this stuff. And of course, to all of our viewers out there, couldn't do it without you. We do it for you. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for tuning in. Again, August 30th, we're going to have Dimitri Lawrence back with Ian, and uh, we're going to bring it back on more advanced notes. So thank you to everybody out there. Stay tuned. Coming up at 5 p.m. Eastern time, we do have Photo Joseph joining us with another Panasonic event. This time we're talking about the GH5 too. That's it for me in the B&H virtual event space.